the kingdom is like unto treasure it in a field, which when a man hath found, he hideth. And for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he hath, had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus saith unto them, have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord. Then said he unto them, Therefore, every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. Here endeth a portion of God's holy words. And we will say thanks be unto God. Hallelujah. We give God our glory, honor, and praises tonight for his loving kindness, for his mercies and his grace. You know, this morning as I got up, the Lord was just speaking into my spirit about encouraging the people of God to hold on, to press on, to continue to do the work of the kingdom. And so it is with joy that we are on tonight to learn a little bit more or much more for some of us or most of us about the kingdom and the parables thereof. Hallelujah, glory be to God. And so I'm going to ask Evangelist Coda to come into the room and to greet us and to pray for Elder Collins before I hand over to him in Jesus' name. Evangelist Coda. Answer. My chambers be free, oh, Holy Spirit, speak to me gently as I close the door, heavenly lover. Let thy presence cover Shekin of all endings It's all I long for I greet us all in the mighty name of Jesus Christ Our soon and coming King I greet Jesus, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. I greet all our elders, Elder Sharp, Elder Collins, Evangelist Mitchell, and all God's wonderful people that are here. I greet you all in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. It's a privilege to be in the presence of the Lord one more night. I'm not sure if Elder Ill is on, but I greet him also in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, as we are coming into your presence, Lord God, to press into your word, Lord God Almighty, to feast at your table, Lord Jesus Christ, one more night, Lord, we thank you. We bless you. We honor you. We exalt you. God, we lift you up. Eternal Father, everlasting King. Hallelujah. Thou art worthy. Thou art the maker. Thou art the ruler of all things. You rule and you reign over the affairs of mankind. Lord Jesus Christ, we can't walk unless you hold our hands. We can't talk unless, Lord Jesus Christ, you fill our mouth with words, Lord Jesus. And so God, as your man's servant, is about, Lord God, to impart knowledge unto us. Father God, we need the knowledge of the kingdom of God. We need what you have to say. Echo, shout, and so God, we pray that you cover him under your blood. 
We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that you will grant him revelatory knowledge, Lord. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that there will be no man's wisdom, but the wisdom of the eternal God will be parted into us tonight lord god we clear the atmosphere we bind algorithms we bind lord god almighty every demon and devil that is set up to frustrate the work of the living god we put them under the blood we cramp and we paralyze the operation of el god Mako shata la basaya katora basi kunda basi kasandolosi cover every device Lord cover every connection God we plead the blood of Jesus Christ there will be no interruption tonight Father we thank you for what you are about to do tonight Hallelujah we bless you in Jesus name can we just come into the room and just worship God just as second saints of God Hallelujah just come into Hallelujah. the room. Thank you, Jesus, oh God. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord you Jesus. Hallelujah. You are worthy, Lord Everybody. Jesus, Open mighty God. You are gracious, oh God. You are Lord Jesus, Thank you, God. Jesus. You are Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory be to the mighty name of Jesus. Morning, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We call it back. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. You are a good, good father. Yes, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. You are a good, good father. Lord Jesus, Jesus. you are everlasting Father. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank Thank you. you. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord God bless you, Evangelist Coda. We stand in comprehensive agreement with that prayer in the name of Jesus. You know, just before I bring on the teacher, I just want to pray specifically for those of you that may be here feeling weak in your body or feeling sick in your body, whether you're on Zoom or Facebook. Father, even now we pray, Lord God, that you will extend your hand of grace and mercy. Jesus, I pray that you will rejuvenate your people tonight, Lord God. Stir them, Lord God. Father, I pray for strength in the body, Lord God. I pray for a divine release into their souls and their spirits. God, I pray for healing over every sick soul right now, Lord God, whether they are sick, Lord Jesus, physically or emotionally just drained, Lord God, feeling frustrated and annoyed, God, Father, I pray right now, Lord Jesus, that you will heal, that you will deliver, that you will strengthen, Lord God Almighty, that you will replenish, Lord God Almighty, sometimes we give so much, Lord God, and Father, we are losing virtue and there is no replenishing, but tonight, God, pouring back into our vessels, we pray in the name of Jesus, God, we subdue that spirit of infirmity infirmity we bind it tonight god and we pray lord god that you'll loose your people lord jesus into complete healing and liberty you, god i pray lord god almighty for focus tonight lord god we come against the spirit of slumber we come against the spirit of sleep i pray lord god for a clear atmosphere lord god and that our spirit man will receive every word of this teaching tonight make us alert and vigilant god responsive and interactive in Jesus' name father we thank you we bless you we praise you even now for these and other mercies we say amen hallelujah if you all could just unmute and say hallelujah before we bring on the speaker we want to make the atmosphere good for him so let's hallelujah. shout a hallelujah 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 glory be to god hallelujah and so without further ado we want to bring on the teacher for tonight one that i truly admire and my spirit loves because I know that he is a sincere man of God. You know, one that I have true honor for because I see him not just as a man of God, but as a father in the gospel. And I know that he truly loves God and he takes time to do what he does. You know, the information that he brings, it doesn't just come by typing it into Google. He sits at the foot of Jesus. I don't 
have to ask, I know. And so tonight we want to bring on Elder Christopher Collins and the Holy Ghost. And we pray, sir, hallelujah, that the Lord will strengthen you as you pour out in Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much, Evangelist. There's a song. I'm here trying to find it. Um, I don't know. It just I just feel urged to sing this song. It says, give me a clean heart that I may know. I, do, I don't know all the words of it. I don't know if you know it. Uh, evangelists could sing that song for me. Um, give me a clean heart that I may serve you. Lord, fix my heart. Familiar okay, with that one may be Evangelist Coda. I'm not sure I know that one. Yeah, Evangelist exactly. Coda, do you know that one? Is it the song that says, Hear my heart, oh God? No, that's not the one. It's, it's give me a clean heart that I might serve you. Lord, fix my heart. That I can be used by you. I'm so unworthy. You don't know that one? No, but I found the words. I'll put it up for you. All right. Yes. All right. So if you can't sing it for me, I'm not in the best of my singing voice tonight at all. But I Oh, that's Sister Collins. That's it. Yeah. So I'm not worthy of all your love. Give me a clean heart. Oh, hallelujah. Indulge me. Can we just do it one more time? Do it for me one more time, Mr. Collins, please. Give me a clean heart that I may serve thee. Lord, fix my heart. <clears throat> Sorry. May be you something. No, I'm not worthy, not worthy of all your blessing. Give me a clean Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sister Collins. Thank you again, Evangelist Mitchell, for... Uh, moderating and starting tonight. Let me just greet everyone that is on tonight in the lovely name of Jesus. It's such a privilege to have you all on tonight. You could have chosen to stay home, probably watch a movie, get some sleep, but you chose to join us tonight. And I'm really appreciative of that for those that are joining also via Facebook. Let me greet you in Jesus' name and and welcome you to this Bible study tonight. It truly has been a very 
wonderful um, ride throughout these studies. Amen. And I believe that the Lord does has a word for us tonight, even though I feel not as prepared as I would have wanted to, but then it is really God that is in charge. Amen. 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 Let me let me hasten on to greet um Elder Sharp, um, Elder Hill if he's on Pastor Marx and um Evangelist Nakoda, uh Evangelist Karen Mitchell and all the different uh, persons that are on. Oh, I see Pastor McDonald as well, Evangelist uh Howitt. Let me greet you all in Jesus' name. I see Elder uh, Rogers on tonight. Amen. And and don't don't feel away if I didn't call your name tonight. You're all special. Title or no title, you are all special. Amen. And so I greet you well in Jesus' name. We have been looking at the parables of the kingdom, and um, we have gone through uh, six of them, six different parables, seven sessions um which would have included the introduction and tonight we'll be looking at the seventh parable of the kingdom amen um which would have made it our eighth lesson in this series amen so as usual i want to do a little recap and so i'm going to be asking you a few questions as it relates to the previous lesson is that okay Yes. Amen. I feel a, a, a rich presence of God even right now in this place. I think God is going to do something extraordinary tonight. Amen. And so we are going to be doing a recap on the parables of the kingdom. All right. And so let's do that recap now. Amen. Amen. Last week we had looked on, let me see, we had looked on the, the pearl of great price. Amen. And um, can anyone tell me anything that stands out for you as it relates to that parable? Something that probably just resonated with you and it, that, that one little sentence, one little word probably it just stay, it just stuck with you. You can't seem to let it go. Anybody want to share with me tonight? Or share with us all tonight? Nobody? Okay. Can you hear me? Are oh, yes. Go ahead, remember? Pastor McDonald. Is it the one, yes. Our salvation is 100% depending on God. That's right. Word, you know, sir, so telling me I cannot earn it. Everything comes through him. Right, right, right. All right. You're, you're, you're through? Yes. <laughs> I just want to. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for that, Pastor McDonald. Anybody else want to share anything that you may have picked up in the previous lesson? Come on, do it fast. We're not going to stay here all night. I know somebody wants to share something. You As Pastor McDonald's. Go ahead. You talk about the pearls, and the pearls had of many different colors, of oh, many yeah. different colors. All right. There were many different colors in the pearl. All right, right. Yes, you remember that. Yes. Yeah, they're, they're not always white as we assume. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they do come in variety of colors. Color. Thank, thank you very much, um, Carol, for that. Anybody else? As Pastor McDonald reminded us that we that is a hundred percent dependent on God, that we can do nothing um, to earn our spot in the kingdom of heaven. No amount of money, no amount of fasting, no amount of praying, strange enough, can't earn you this spot in the kingdom of heaven. It is all grace. And the grace of God is a gift. Amen. A gift. So you don't pay for a gift. It's given to you freely. Is that right? Anybody else? 
All right. I don't okay, buy this I one. Remember, yes. What I remember is um, you said that pearls have long been known as the queen of gems. Oh, yes. That wow. they, are, they are the most expensive jewels in the world. Yes. And so in this parable of the pearls, it's a price that Christ pays. That's what I remember. All right. Great. Thank you so much for that. You're, you're kind of breaking up a while ago, though. Don't know what was happening. You're kind of breaking up. All right. We also mentioned, if you remember, we are, we are pearls actually found normally. In the sea. Right, but we are in the sea. The oyster. Don't hear. Right, it's found in an oyster. I like what you just said a while ago. It's found in an oyster, and the oyster is where? In the sea? But we are exactly in the sea. Bottom of the sea. Bottom of the sea. The bottom of the sea. And we, we also talked about genuine pearls. We talk about cultured pearls. And we mentioned that cultured pearls are those that involve um, human intervention in order to get the oyster to make the pearls and to make them of variety of shapes and colors. So, you know, um, individuals actually have these oyster farms where they know um, they 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 somewhat cause the, the, the pearl to be formed in a particular way. So these are what they call cultured pearl, but then you have the genuine pearl that has no human intervention in terms of how it is formed inside the oyster. And these are taken from the bottom of the ocean, wherever they are, and have to be removed from the oyster. What did we say that the, the sea represents? Anybody can remember? people ah people and so we we have been called from multitudes of people languages cultures and so forth different ethnicities amen into the kingdom of god and we're going to be looking a little bit on that again tonight not necessarily in the parable of the pearl but in this parable that we're going to be looking on tonight all right. Um, okay, so I think we can move right on to the next um, parable. All right, and this is the parable that we want to look on tonight. It's called the parable of the dragnet. The parable of the net, but I rather to use the term dragnet, and as I'll explain that as we go on. So. I'm going to draw your attention again to the, a portion of the same scripture that Evangelist Mitchell had um, drawn on tonight, just from verse uh, 47. We're just going to go from verse 47 down to about verse 15. All right. So here we go. All right. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world, the angels. Are you seeing that? not back on screen so shall it be at the end of the world the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from amongst the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth and we'll stop right there at verse 50 and so here we are looking at the parable of the dragnet as you can see the picture on screen there is showing a dragnet with uh 
quite a lot of fish. I wish I could catch this amount of fish. I I like fishing, but I am not a, I'm not good at fishing. <laughs> you know, I I seldom catch uh, catch a few, but uh, Lord, I was at the. Let me just share with you. <laughs> Since we're talking about fishing, I, I went by the, because I do, I do shore fishing, um, and I went by a particular spot a couple of weeks ago to catch fish, and I threw out my lines, and man, I was dealing with my rods, nice rods, nice line, nice hook, nice, everything looking nice, and I got the bite, but I just wasn't reeling in anything. Then I saw a tool command came on, you know, and um, they didn't have a rod. They just had a, a, a juice bottle and wrapped some, some fishing line over the juice bottle. And they just stand on a rock and they just throw the line out there. And by the time you look, bam, three fish on the line. And the guy was just throwing out the line out there, you know. And he was just catching fish. I mean, he probably caught close to a dozen or more fish just from a juice bottle with a few uh, with some some fishing line on it and i'm asking him, what conversation did you have with the fish what plans in the mid i mean why 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 wasn't i catching any fish here am i have my rig i have everything set up the different lines the different hooks the different weights and i just was not catching fish there is actually an art to fit to catching fish so you can have all the right tools, but if you don't know how to catch fish, you just can't catch fish. But Jesus did say to his disciples in Matthew chapter 4 that he's going to make them fishers of men. Amen. And so even, that, even though you, know, you cannot just be a good person at catching fish, just, just like that, you know, there are some people who can, there are some people who can't. Some people may learn, some people may have difficulty learning like myself, but there are just some that just, they are just skilled that way. Amen. So that's just a light, a light um, moment there in terms of my fishing experience, but I still love fishing. I'm not going to let that stop me from going fishing. It's those moments that I use to meditate and to, you know, talk with the Lord. Strange enough, I like to be out near the sea when the wind blow you know, and um, blow against me, I get to meditate. So it does a lot for me, more than just the fun of fishing. Amen. It does a lot for me. Now, fishing in the Bible times, um, even as today, as I said, I was using a rod. This guy was just you. These two guys were just using um, lines wrapped up on, on drinks bottle. Nothing fancy, nothing expensive but they were catching fish i asked him what kind of bait were you using he said oh i was just using worm and i had my nice expensive shrimp out there and just wasn't getting anything on the line <laughs> you know but but there are different ways to catch fish and when christ instructed peter at one point to catch a fish and to look in its mouth for a coin he referred to he was referring to a kind of fishing that would have been done with like what I did with a line and hook or probably what those guys did. I don't know if they had rods like, like me then. So, you know, he said, just throw a line out there and um, with the first fish that catch the line, you bring it in, you cut it open, open this mouth, you're going to see a coin that can pay or taxes that have been, that is now due. And then there's a second way of um, catching fish and that is to cast a net. And normally these nets are, are, are circular um, and it would have like a cord through it. And, um, and then the cord, no, you would pull that cord and it would gradually close the neck of the net and somewhat kind of trap the fish. And um, this was probably the method that Peter and his brother Andrew were using when Christ had called them to come and to follow him um, in Matthew chapter 4. So Peter and Andrew, and of course, they brought in James and John, who were also um, fishermen. The, these guys have been fishermen um, long before Jesus called them. So to them, the, 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 the old idea of this dragnet, and this now is the next 
um, type of fishing that I want to share with us tonight. So they understood this idea of a dragnet and they, it was quite a, a, a clear and vivid picture in their mind. So their work now entailed using a net, the same dragnet um, that was pretty big. It was, it was not a small net. The dragnet was quite large. Amen. And um, the, the dragnet would now be weighted with lead. You have lead weights all around the dragnet, the edges of the dragnet. And it, what it was designed to do was to sweep the bottom of the sea floor. And in doing so, it would gather the fishes in, in masses. So how they would do it is that they would have two boats that would drag the net. Yeah, two boats. So the net would be stretched from one boat across to the next one. And these two boats now would drag the net between them. And then the weighted section of the net now would be sweeping a section of the seafloor, whether it was on the Sea of Galilee that, that they were doing the fishing. And after that now, you know, the sailors, when, once they bring it near to shore now, they would now haul because it would have trapped the fish. Amen. Because the weighted part of the net would, would, uh, would keep the fish from slipping under. And so the boats would keep the fish, fish from, from slipping around them. And so they would now bring the boats into shore. And in so doing, they would sweep the, the, the sea floor and uh, trap the fish. And the, the, all these fish would now come in and then they would now haul it onto shore. And then after hauling it to shore now, the, the fishermen now would go through the entire net. And what they would do now is keep the good fish and they would sometimes burn those that, they are, con that are considered substandards so that they probably wouldn't have to catch them again. Some they would probably throw back in the water, but some they would, they would, they would discard off. So the dragnet um, referred so in this text that we read in uh, Matthew 13, verse 47, is known today as what they call trawl nets. Um, I don't know if you have heard the, that, that word trawlers, um, trawl net. That, so they have a thing they call trawling. And it's pretty much the same thing. It's still a method that is being used in fishing today. So it's, it's what we call now a trawl net. So in Christ's time, these these long and wide nets could reach to as, as wide as um, even half a mile. That's how, how wide these nets were, even as much as half a mile. So you would just imagine how much fish you could bring in with one drag of a net that wide. And so they would be attached behind one of the boats, amen, and the top of the net now would have um, floats on it to keep that up the top. And so the, the, the weights, the lead weights at the bottom or with the rocks or whatever would keep the, 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 the other section of the net down. And, and this is how it would work. So while the bottom would have the weights, as the boats now move through the water, the dragnet would catch everything that is in its way. Amen. And, 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 and you know, it works in such a silent way that poor, poor little fish them don't even realize what is happening. All they know is that their space is getting less and less and less and the water is getting shallower and shallower and they don't realize and it's, until it's too late that they are trapped and they are actually in a net. So the net passes through the water and it gathers the fish. I hope that that, that, that does give us a little understanding of um, how the, the whole dragnet works. Now, what I want to, 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 to talk about here for a little while is, and I, I really don't think I'm going to be long tonight, but is that diversity reflects the kingdom of God. Amen. And I say that, and um, I'm going to park on this for a little while, um, because I realize that even now in church, we we still have a difficulty dealing with people that might have differences in views and, and um, on opinions. And if we're not careful, sometimes we can ostracize the, the very people 
amen, that God has brought in the kingdom. So diversity reflects the kingdom of God. If you notice in the creation of all the different creatures, that the creatures all had different um, makeup, different appearances. Some have feathers, some have fur, some have four legs, some have a hundred legs like centipede. And so you, you, there, there is variety. And so we see um, variety in God's creation, in the animal kingdom, amen, in the, 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 the sea, in the ocean, we see variety in fish, and which is why I'm talking about diversity, because this net that was pulling in the fish was not selective as to what kind of fish it would get. So the net didn't say, have a sign written on, on it says only snapper, nor did the net have a sign written on it say only sprat you know, or grunt or whatever is your liking where fish is concerned. It just grab everything and pull it in. Amen. So one of the things I want to point out, as I say that about the diversity that reflects the kingdom of God is one thing, creation. When we look on creation, especially we look on us, as God's creation, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter one, that we are created in the very image of God. Amen. Not one of us was, was made apart from the creative, thoughtful design of God, our creator. Every single one of us was, he, he God carefully thought it through in how he made us. So if my nose is a little broader than yours, don't think it was a mistake. God carefully thought it through in terms of how he made me. My complexion, whatever my height, it was God's design. And so we all will not look together, look, look the same, but it is God's design. And it's obvious that we not only look different, sometimes we behave different. Sometimes we think differently, but it's a part of God's design. And so he says he's making man in his own image. Amen. I want to turn to the book of Psalm 139 quickly. Um, let me bring it up on screen for you. Psalm 139 verses 13 and uh, 14. Let me just read that together. Here the psalmist says, for thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee for I am what? Fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. Amen. I think each one of us on tonight we can rejoice because God has made you fearfully and wonderfully. Amen. I know sometimes because of what Hollywood has done, people sometimes become dissatisfied with their body, body shape and their, their hair color and their, you know, and their, their, their entire image, they become dissatisfied. But the fact is that God had made you and he had made me. He had made all of us as individuals, fearfully and wonderfully. Let's think about the, the wonderfully and the fearfully. Think about it. In other words, when you look at these words, fearfully and wonderfully, it means that it was not just something you just shake up and just throw it out and it just happened like that. It, it, it indicates that there was effort and time put into making us, into making you as an individual, into making me. It was not just, you know, just a byproduct of some big explosion. We were carefully formed. 
Hallelujah. I think Jeremiah talks about how God had started forming him, even in the curious parts, in the dark, the dark places of his mother's womb. God was already calling him and forming, forming him. He says, my substance, the psalmist says, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. That's um, verse 15 of the same um, Psalm 139. Amen. And so I'm talking about diversity, diversity in the kingdom of God. Amen. Just as how this net might have in it snapper, it might have in it grunt, it might have in it makabak, it might have in it Welsh band. And you know, I don't, I don't know all the different fish. Amen. I know a few, but you know, but a wide variety of fish was in this net. But it is God's way of pointing out to us that when he calls people into the kingdom, amen, they are going to come in with various personalities and uh, various characteristics about them. Amen. Notice where the fish is caught in the sea, in the ocean. And again, as we said in the previous parable, that the sea represents people. It represents uh, nations and different languages, tongues and, and different um, ethnicities, you know. And so in the same way, the, the fish is being drawn out of the ocean. We also, as a people of God, have been drawn out of the multitudes. Amen. Amen. So we are, God, God um, expresses this diversity in his kingdom through the creation. Amen. So God doesn't discriminate in his design. He doesn't create one human being greater than the other. In case you didn't know that, <laughs> he didn't create a human being greater than the other. Nobody is greater than the next person. Amen. Do I hear an amen there? Amen. Amen. All right. That was, that was testing to see that I'm not talking to myself tonight. Right. Amen. So he doesn't discriminate in his design. None at all. Amen. None of us is better than the other. And that is why even Jesus trying to teach how the kingdom of God works. He says, look, the kingdom of God is not supposed to operate like the kingdom of the world. Because in the kingdom of the world, they set up kings, they set up um, people over people. And so you have this social divide, but not so in the kingdom of God. It's sad that sometimes in church, we, there, there is a social divide. We might not admit it, but it happens in some, in some circles in church. But nobody is greater than anybody, irrespective of titles in the church. Whether you be an archbishop, deacon, pastor, elder, or you are an usher, or you just come with no specific title being um, done on you, you are still special. And... And the, nobody is above you. Amen. Nobody's above you. So Jesus had to re-emphasize this when he was doing the exercise of the washing of his disciples' feet. Notice when he came around to washing Peter's feet, Peter said, no, Lord, don't let it be so. You can't do that. Oh, you can do that. And you are the master. But he said, look, man, if I don't do it, you don't have any part and lot with me. He was trying to establish the fact that we are here to serve each other. And if we are here to serve each other, it means that none of us is better than the next one. Amen. And so in church, amen, it can't be just one person being served. And that's the, the, the lead of a church. Everybody has to be willing to serve each other. And don't reserve that just for a large supper. Don't reserve it just for a food watching service because that would be just going through a ritual. But it must be something that we practice in our day-to-day -day life. Amen. That 
we 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 see each other the bible said let every man look not on his own things but let us look on the things of others every day we have to see the next person as better than ourselves not better in the sense that they have been made better and greater but that they have needs just like you and i amen and therefore, the golden rule comes in that we do unto others as we would like others to do unto us. So the diversity of God's kingdom is demonstrated through creation, but it's also demonstrated in redemption. Amen. It's demonstrated in redemption because we are all created in need of God's saving grace, regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of where our, our, our social status, where we were born, what, what, what community we come from, it really doesn't matter. We are all created in need of God's saving grace. Amen. Hallelujah. Because you see, the fall of man, it affects all of us. Amen. The Bible said we all have fallen short, come short of the glory of God. That's what I think it said somewhere in Romans chapter three, that we all have sinned, amen, and come short of the glory of God. But the good news is that Jesus died not for one tribe, not for one nation, not for one particular group of people in a particular church, but he died for every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Amen. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Amen. That he gave. Hallelujah. So he didn't just love Israel. He didn't just love um, the UK. Amen. Or the Bahamas. But God so loved the world that he gave. Hallelujah. So his mission Therefore, was to seek and to save that which was lost. And that which was lost is everyone. Every single one of us was lost. Amen. The Great Commission reminds us, you know, if you remember the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, reading verse 19 onward to verse 20. Amen. So that we should go into all the world and, and teach all nations. Amen. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. So we have been commanded to go and to make disciples of some nations, some people. No, all nations, all people, all dialects. Amen. Every strata of society must be affected by this gospel. Amen. So Jesus commissioned his disciples that they were to make more disciples out of every nation. And this is why the, the, the church spread its wing and, and went to different regions of the world. Amen. So as Christians, amen, we have to remember that we are all bought with the same blood, the same blood, amen. One blood that has brought us into this one family. And we talk about family, the next um, thing that reflects this diversity in the kingdom of God is adoption, amen. Adoption into the family of God. So we looked on first creation, that we are image bearers because we have been created in the image of God. Then we look on redemption that through the gospel message, we all are saved because every single man that have been born of woman in this world was in need of redemption, in need of salvation. Now we're looking on adoption. And when we talk about adoption, we are talking about a family. So we have now been adopted into the family of God. So as Christians, we are, adopt, we are what we call adopted children of God. Amen. Paul tells us of this new bloodline. Amen. When he said that the spirit 
itself now bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So it's a new bloodline that now runs in, in us through the spirit. And it says, and if children, then we are now hearers and hearers of God and fellow hearers with Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me bring that scripture up in the book of Romans, from the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. Romans chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. It says here, the spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children then hears, hears of God and joint hears with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Amen. So we are here and we are joint here with Jesus Christ. So this is, so understand that. Let me slow that down a bit. So we are here. That means we can inherit things in the kingdom of God. And we are joint ears with Jesus. That means that we are adopted in the family. And that's how we are now classified as sons of God. Hallelujah. We have been adopted. Glory be to God. Amen. All right. So we're talking about adoption. Hallelujah. And uh, his spirit is bearing witness with our spirit. So even before, before Jesus' death, hallelujah. Jesus affirmed the importance of being a part of the, the family of God. Amen. In addressing the people while his mother and his brother um, stood outside, Jesus, you know, Jesus asked the question, who is my mother? <laughs> you remember that question? Who is my mother and who is my brother? Because they come to him and say mother and him brother outside. He said, who is my mother and who is my brother? And he stretched out his hand. You know, I can just imagine him stretching out his hand and, you know, just, just, just pointing to all the disciples that were there with him. Amen. And so I just see him just, you know, pointing towards them. And he said, here are my, my mother and my brothers. For whosoever that does the will of my father, hallelujah, in heaven, that person is my brother. That person is my sister, and that person is my mother. We're talking about adoption, you know. Hallelujah. So when we are adopted into the kingdom of God, and we start do, doing the will of God, we have this assurance that we are indeed sons of God. Amen. Because the adopted child, you know, is not given second privileges, you know. According to the law of adoption, you know, you have all the privilege of, of the, the legitimate child, you know. Amen. So we that are adopted don't, don't think, say, is, is, is a bastard relationship you have with God. No, <laughs> it's not a bastard relationship. Amen. We are sons of God. Amen. So Jesus isn't suggesting when he talked about you know, his, his mother and his brother. He wasn't in any way suggesting that our biological families are no longer important. By no means is he suggesting that, but rather he's stating that following him is something that is far greater. Amen. So he takes priority and so, and, and so should the kingdom of God take priority in our life. Amen. So much so that those that followed him Amen. Are counted as his mother, his brother, his sister, his family. Hallelujah. The family of God. Hallelujah. So when you think about it then, you and I, and I don't know how many persons are on right now. Um, I'm seeing what, 42 persons that are on, on, on this Zoom platform. I don't know how many are on, on um, Facebook. But we are from different um, different backgrounds, but we are all brothers and sisters adopted into the family of God. And so I can only conclude that the family of God, the kingdom of God is very colorful. Hallelujah. It's very colorful. Hallelujah. 
Glory be to God. Different personalities, different um, characteristics, but we are all still the family of God. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Amen. Because one of the problems we have is we confuse unity and uniformity. Amen. This is a problem I see happening amongst many of us as believers. We 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 feel that you know if persons doesn't um doesn't look exactly like us and talk the same way and walk. As a matter of fact, some people go as far as to use even the tongues. And so if someone's tongue doesn't sound like your tongue that you're accustomed to in your particular congregation or your corner of the world, you might assume that this is this person of a different spirit. And I've and I've come across that I I heard a story many decades of, ago of a brother that was in a particular church and um, he spoke with tongues that just did not sound like everybody else. Because somehow we, 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 we think everybody's going to speak in tongues like we, like, you know, you and I, we're going on. And some would even go as far as to say some people has not matured because five years ago is the same tongue you have now. Where do we get these doctrines from? You know, um, well, oh, you still have the same tongue, yet not even your tongue grow, <laughs> mature. But another time we'll probably touch on that because I know it can be a very sensitive era for some people. But I just have to be blunt and straight. Amen. As we touch this tonight. But unity and uniformity is not necessarily the same thing. Uniformity is when you want everybody to look the same, sound the same, walk the same, talk the same, think the same. But again, we're talking about diversity that reflects the kingdom of God. And so we are not going to all sound the same. So back to the story. So this young, this youngster spoke with tongues and people was thinking that he was demon possessed until a missionary um, that uh, worked in some area in Africa came to that particular church and heard the young man speaking in, in tongue, that, that tongue. And this same young man that was ostracized and considered to be demon possessed the missionary was able to identify the tongue as a dialect that he was familiar with, with one of the tribes that he did missionary work with in, in that section of Africa. So you see, um, sometimes we, we can try to get people to sound like us, look like us, dress like us. And, you know, um, and so what we are aiming for really is uniformity, but uniformity is not necessarily unity because people can be coming together to the same place of worship, looking the same, you know, singing the same song, but they are at odds with each other. There is no real unity. Here's one that is bitter against the next one. And, and you just have this animosity going on and, and all of these little strifes and war. Even the apostle asks a question. We, where are all these strifes and, and contentions are coming from? Where is it coming from? You know? And so as we aim for you, you, uniformity, we have to remember that that is not necessarily unity. One of the scriptures some people have used some time to, to create a, a wedge, to put a wedge between them and others is the scripture in the book of Amos. Amen. Amos chapter 3. Let me bring that up. Um, chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Amos chapter 3. Do I have it? Yes, I do. The question is asked, in the book of Amos, can two walk together except they be agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he had no prey? Will a young lion cry out in his den if he have taken nothing? So the, the part, the verse three is what we really want to focus on because I've heard this quoted many times and people use this as an excuse 
I don't say reason as an excuse not to fellowship with someone else because they say we don't agree, so we can't fellowship. And so we have this, this splintering that, that's happening in Christendom, happening right here in the apostolic movement because of disagreement. And so we don't feel we can walk because we don't see eye to eye on this. We don't. And so we, we, we get splintered. If you remember, there was a contention that was brewing with Abraham's herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen. And, uh, you know, Abraham said, look, um, this thing is going to get out of hand. It's best that you, you go this direction. If you go east, I go west. You go north, I go south. But they parted with an understanding, not as enemies, but to not cause the contention to grow. They found it necessary to somewhat separate themselves in terms of not being in the same space. And sometimes this is allowed. This happened with the apostles between Barnabas and, and um, Paul, Mark, and all these kind of things. You had sometimes this kind of uh, um, thing happening where they, they come out of the same space, but they were still united. There was no bitterness. There was no, no rift, amen, and hatred and, and, and malice. But just that sometimes... Um, Folks can't communicate so well together. And so they had to change space. And it is evident that there was nothing, um, no, no animosity between Abraham and Lot. Because when Lot was captured by five heathen kings, Abraham was the one that went to Lot's rescue, defeated those kings, rescued his nephew, and that's where we get the story now with Melchizedek and all that kind of thing. So he ran to the rescue of his nephew to show that the love was still there. There was no animosity between them. Sometimes, yes, you have to come out of the same space, but we have to watch our spirit. So when it says, can two walk together except they be agreed? It's not, it's not talking that we can't have disagreement. It's not talking about that. What is real? And I, I would like to quote to you from, um, from another, from a, probably about two more translations. One other translation put it this way. Can two walk together without agreeing where to go? You know, this is what it's saying. Can two walk together without agreeing where to go? Another translation puts it this way. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Another translation says this. Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? So it's not talking about not seeing eye to eye on every single matter. When we, take the, when we, when we commute in the mornings to get to work or to school and we commute on these public transport, um, transportation, whether it be the bus, the train, the car, whatever, the taxi, whatever, right? We are sitting beside or standing beside people that are going in the same direction as we are going. Isn't that so? But though we are going in the same direction, you are there in this taxi or in this bus, and you and the person standing beside you going into Alfred Tree, going into New Kingston or wherever, if you're overseas, you, you, you're moving from Bronx, you're going down to Brooklyn, you're on the train, whatever you're on. But you're on the train going in the same direction with a whole bunch of people. And between you and them, you have different political views. You have different religious views. Yeah, but you're going in the same direction. You follow what I'm saying? If we, if we understand that now in the context of the church, that we can be going in the same direction, have the same vision as believers, all of us, our desire, our vision is to make it into the kingdom of God, to make it into heaven. All of us want 
to make it in. As I've said in previous studies that there is just one heaven. We don't have a heaven for this group and for that group and for different, you know. It's one heaven. And we are aiming to go to that place. Even as much as some people would try to make it seem that some people can't make it in because you don't agree with me. God help you if you can make it into heaven. No, I don't have to agree with you with everything. But one thing I do know is that we both love Jesus. I, 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 don't, I can love you without agreeing with everything you say. I hope you're following what I'm saying, you know, people of God. Because what we should be aiming for is not necessarily uniformity, but unity. Amen. Because we will have different opinions from time to time, depending on um, how we have been socialized, depending on um, how, how much reading. Some have done more reading than others, and therefore the information that this person has is different than the information that that one have or the lack thereof. Yeah, and so the, the views are going to vary. But at the end of the day, we want to know that we love each other. And we all love the Lord. Amen. And so we should endeavor to always try to see if we can bridge these, these gaps. Even if we have to, to come out of the same space. But let no bitterness. Abraham said to Lot, look. He says, we are brethren. Therefore, let us change the space that we are in. I'm paraphrasing. He said, we are brethren. We are family. And this continuing like this is only going to exacerbate the situation. It's going to escalate in terms of the contention. So let us, for a while, let's, let's, let's move out of the same space. But I want you to know I love you. You understand? We are family. Don't write off each other. Amen. Let's not, I, I, I'm I kind of dwelling long on this. I didn't intend to because there's so much more. Maybe there's going to have to be a part two to this. But let's not write off each other. Hallelujah. Amen. We are aiming for unity. Unity in the spirit. Can somebody praise the Lord with me? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Thank you, Lord. Lord. Amen. Uh, Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Bless your holy name, Jesus. Hallelujah. There is too much hurt, too much silent sufferers, even in church, because of hurt. Hurt. We have not perfected the art of making things right with each other. We have not perfected the art of communication. And before we can talk about reaching the world and winning the world and, 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 and growing our churches, we have to find out what is it that I'm lacking in terms of building the bridges that have been broken down between each other, between us. Amen. The song says, you're my brother, you're my sister. You know, we can't be just walking past each other and, um, you know, treating each other like we no longer exist because of misunderstanding, because of disagreements. We, we are, we're, we're going to have disagreements, but don't let each other feel less important. Let's not make the next person feel unimportant and unnecessary. As I said in, the, in one of the lessons that we have to move beyond seeing each other as just assets in our churches, as resource persons, because as we age, our resourcefulness will diminish. And when we can no longer give as we used to and do as we used to, we don't have the strength to do some of the things that we used to do. Will we still be remembered? 
when we are aged, when we can no longer give as much of our talents, our strength. But when we see each other as valuable as individuals, God's creation as image bearers of God himself, that is the first thing that should come to our mind that my brother is a bearer of God's image, not an asset to my church, not an asset to my congregation. He's a bearer of God's image. Therefore, I have to treat him right. No wonder Jesus said, if we take the little one, the least of these of my disciples and treat them and, and offend them, it would have been better that we put a millstone around our neck and cast ourselves off in the river or wherever. Because we have to see that each person, each individual is an image bearer of the almighty God. We, not, we don't just love each other and love one another for what, we can, what they can do or what they can give. We have to love them because they, like me, are image bearers. You're an image bearer, irrespective of what your title is. And if you have none, you are an image bearer of God. And I have to love you as much as I love anybody else. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest. Let's just pause for a while. I just want to just pause for a while. And let's let that sink for a little while. Hallelujah. 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 This may be, may require part two, where we now look, where we will be looking at the separation, the separation that is going to take place with the fish that have been hauled in. And what is separated is not the sprat from the parrot, nor the parrot from the snapper, nor the grunt. That's not what cause the separation of the fish all of them are just as necessary irrespective of what type of fish they were what was separated is that which was not edible that which might not be i remember as a youngster in high school i liked fishing from that time and i went over to Port Royal and caught some fish. I went in a boat and started catching some fish there. And I did, I, poor me, I didn't know much about fish and I caught a particular fish and a fisherman said to me, you need to throw that back in. You can't eat that. That fish is poisonous. You know, I didn't know. And so when they hauled in this wide variety of fish, Amongst it was fish that was not considered edible. Some were probably diseased. Some were probably poisonous. Probably there were some that were undersized. But what was separated was not the variety or the species. Or just, you know, it, was snap, it wasn't snappers taken out and thrown back because all we want is parrot. There's a market for parrot and there's a market for snapper. But what was taken note is that which was useless. Useless. Hallelujah. But that which is edible, irrespective of the type of fish, and each fish requires different preparation in order for it to be edible or to be you know, palatable, not edible, but palatable, requires different separation. Some, some you can't fry, some you have to steam, some you have to roast. And every fish can fry. And every fish can roast. You understand me? But they're all edible. But for it to be palatable, because of the variety, the preparation differs from fish to fish. So what is taken out is not the variety, but that which is not edible. Hallelujah. So again, the stress should not be on uniformity. 
They didn't throw them throwing back the ones that they didn't want because not because it couldn't be eaten, but this was the one that this it, we, all we want is parrot today. Me no want no grunt, so you throw it back in the water or you get rid of it. That's not what these fishermen did. And so we have no choice in our churches, in our congregation, as to who are the people we want inside there. Hallelujah. This gospel message, if we preach this gospel message, the right gospel message, and that net is thrown out there and start, and start pulling and drawing in all kinds of people. You can't go through though and say you don't want this kind of person and you don't want that kind of person. For it is God that works in us both to will and to do of his own good pleasure. It is God that calls people. Hallelujah. He works through us, but it is through his word that people are drawn to the kingdom. The spirit draws them. Hallelujah. And so we have to be so careful of the, the anxiety to get rid of those that we can't manage and to get rid of those that we have difficulty communicating with and the distance that sometimes we create with between each other. I don't know why I'm, I'm talking along this line, you know. I didn't even know I would be same so much along this line but i believe that as the kingdom of god as kingdom people that if we are to be as effective as we need to be in this world we have to know how to to deal with our per, our relationships with each other if you notice the fruit of the spirit the fruit of the spirit every aspect of the fruit of the spirit if you look on it carefully as it the, the, the benefit of it is to fix relationships. We say that by the fruits we shall know them. Well, the fruit of the spirit helps us to fix relationships. That's what it helps us do. If we examine the different components, long suffering, when we have long suffering, it helps us to bear with people that are not easy to get along with. Patience, meekness help us to be more gentle in dealing with people than to be abrasive and, 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 and cantankerous. We, we, we learn to be meek and kindness and love and faith and the word faith there that is mentioned in the fruit of the spirit is from the word of faithfulness. So it's not talking about faith for believing for something. It's talking about faithfulness. So when you put all of these different components of the fruit of the spirit, the kindness, the gentleness, the faithfulness, the meekness, the long suffering, the temperance, which is self-control, the peace, the joy, all these different components points towards relationship skills. And these are the things that God uses to let the world see that Christ is working through us. For by their fruit, you shall know them. Hallelujah. And so when we fail to manifest to utilize the fruit of the spirit, we are going to fail in winning the world and in reaching this generation. And so we have to fix that. Amen. Amen. It's 9.01. I'm going to stop here. I would have wanted to, to go into... Um, the separation of the righteous and the wicked and, and all these kind of thing and, you know, and, and go, go into a little bit more explanation of that. But I think I'm going to, to stop right here and God's willing next week, we pick up from here and move into
talking about the different the two groups of people the righteous and the wicked amen that this, this is where the separation now is going to take place amen so god richly bless you i just want to thank you for your patience tonight and for joining on this bible study tonight i'm handing back over to the moderate i'm not sure who is if uh evangelist carry on with you okay god bless you god bless you God Almighty, can I tell you, Elder, that I was just about ready to sit down and listen. I felt like you just started like 15 minutes ago. This was just so powerful. You know, it really spoke to my heart. You know, as you got to that point where you were talking about gentleness, you know, I, I, I typed on social media that sometimes it's through a closed mouth. You know, as believers, we always want to say something and sometimes what comes out of our mouth is very abrasive. So sometimes the Lord will shut your mouth so that the peace can abide. And I've learned that in my own life, you know, because sometimes you want to just say as it is, but it doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do, even though it looks like that. You know, sometimes we can take up petty things and it becomes a divider because what this person doesn't do it the way that you want it to be done but God created us so individually I love this you know as you were talking about the dragnet I made um some notes because you know to me the way that you described it it's the message of the gospel and when it goes down to the deep the weight that's on it should be the glory of God that's going down and it's supposed to keep people from slipping under and when they're in the boat, Lord God Almighty, it's your responsibility from keeping them from slipping around, Lord Jesus, because we know that people are finicky when they first come to the Lord. But you give them so much of God that they are able to abide and stay on board, no matter how rocky it may be. You know, I just really love this. You know, as you spoke about creation and us being image bearers, it's more than just saying I'm a Christian. The word of God should, should be so deep within you or so that you don't even have to open up your mouth. People look at you and they see. You know, you spoke about the diversity in redemption. I know it is that the Lord came to save all, not some. You know, the other day I was speaking to the children's group and I was saying to them that we have a tendency as people to want to give the gospel to who we think God should save. But God came for, for all. He came for the murderer, the rapist, the liar, the thief. He came for all of us. There's no um, you know, distinction or discrimination where the soul is concerned. God wants all. Whether you're paralyzed or you're able to use all of your motor skills, whether you're educated or not, whether you're poor or you're rich, you know, and then you talked about the adoption, and that is my favorite thing, Lord God, because I am a part of that. And the, the, the legality that God used to bring us in, we have the same rights like Israel have. We have the same um, inheritance. As a matter of fact, even more, the word of God says that we are seated together with Christ in heavenly places. This was just such a rich presentation. The Lord God bless you indeed. And I'm going to ask everyone to just unmute and say the Lord bless you, Elder Collins. Lord bless you, Elder Collins. The Lord bless you indeed. Bless you, Lord Collins. Lord bless you. Divine favor, divine impartation. Hallelujah, Jesus. We agree. Hallelujah. You know, the way that you presented was just so very, um, simple you gave it to us in bite size that a baby could come on and understand and that's what teaching ought to be it reaches all but again it had that that weight it's the dragnet i love that part but i don't know oh my god i really love that part so bad and so i'm going to open up right now for anyone that has a comment or a question feel free to raise your hand and we're going to go into that section right now those of you that are on um, facebook please type in the chat and we look at your question or your comment and we will share it all right so anyone with a question anyone with a comment please come into the room
No one with a comment, no one with a question. Let me look at Facebook. Sister Unique said she could feel the presence of God during this teaching. Elder Collins, my God, so true, was very rich and powerful. All right, go ahead, Evangelist Coda. Blessings, Elder, again. So while you were teaching, all I was hearing was, they that go down to the scene ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. <laughs> that was all I was hearing in my spirit while you were teaching, when you were speaking about the dragnet. And God had given me a revelation about the scripture. Um, Sister Mitchell made a very powerful point when she says that it's important that that dragnet be sturdy and able to sustain us, you know, even if we slip and we fall. But then the scripture tells us too that it really requires us going into the deep to see the great wonders of Jesus Christ. It really requires us getting off that um, seashore. The dragnet, the, the net that is launched into the water, this place at a vantage point where it can catch a vast amount of fish cannot be placed on the surface because enough will not go into it. It has to be placed. At, at my, my father was a fisherman. And so I used to watch him draw the, the net when you were speaking about the ones that it was tonight. I was talking to my son about it too because he doesn't know. My father was a fisherman and I, we used to watch him. He used to do deep sea diving. So he used to go extremely deep to, to, to plant that net and sometimes it takes him the entire evening to come back you wonder is he still alive yes or no it requires him putting it at a certain vantage point and it could not be surfaced it had to be deep and then when he pulls that net the amount of fish that is coming home with I'm saying this to say, the deep is required, the dragnet is required, the sturdiness is required. Echo shot of a sire. Hallelujah, katoshama, alabasai, and the katoshama. The position is required. When he's pulling up that dragnet, he will tell you that he has to be careful. If he's not careful, net can break the water can cause that net to be ripped apart there's so many things that can cause a damage when he's pulling that net and so he has to get help to pull the net my god hallelujah jesus glory to god mighty god so this is very powerful very very powerful and i appreciate you i'll just leave it there god bless you God bless you, Evangelist Cody. You know, as you mentioned about getting help to pull the, 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 the catch up, I had made a note because some years ago, I went fishing for the first time in Cape Cod and I don't like to feel anything wriggling like that in my hand. So one of the things that they advise you to do is to get gloves because the spike of the fish on the side, those, those fins that sticks out, um, scale that sticks out, when they're twisting their bodies, it tends to become like a, a weapon. It's a defense mechanism against you pulling it off the line. Now, when we went location, as you said, was very vital. And I listened to Elder Collins talking about the men who came. You know, there were people on the boat. They didn't come with line like us. You know, they had some three things on it. Some of them had four. And it's when they cast that they were at different positions from us. When they cast it in no time, they caught over 100 fish and they were cut off because there was a limit. 
Now, one of the things that we learned is that when you pulled up that catch, you would look at the size of the fish and the type of fish because you were only supposed to catch a specific type. There are other types like Elder says it's poisonous, it's not edible. And some size is not legal for you to be eating. Lord Jesus, it tells us that within the kingdom, you need help, you need the right equipment. So when you go down in the deep and you come up, there are some that's not ready yet. Cognitively, they're not ready yet to receive the word. My God, so you have to throw them back a little, Lord God, and come back another time for them when they have developed and grown some. And then there, there are some that's just not useful. But the Lord is the one that decides it. My God, very powerful. Evangelist God, and like you said, it takes patience because um, fishing can be an all-night um, experience too, depending on position. You know, sometimes you're on this side and you have to change and go over on that side because they're not taking the bite. So you have to go over on the other side. Lord Jesus, my God. Go ahead, Pastor McDonald. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, Hello? we can hear you, woman. Oh, yes, sorry. Right. yes yeah, you can go um, ahead. Yeah, it's, oh God, such a powerful teaching and everything you ladies have said. There's such a lot going around in my mind, you know, to take each segment and to sit and go through. But I was just um, thinking about the uniformity, the damage that it has caused in God's kingdom. Um, I think I've seen many people leave in church and being damaged because they are a bit different to what the status quo was. And you know, I, I just a little story for me in the early stages of my conversion, the Lord always led me to speak to different people, you know, because you know, you know, um, us in the early days, us apostolic, <laughs> well, over here anyway, they didn't mix with other um, denomination, but the Lord was always sending me. And you know, I'm gonna hear what God is saying. And it it in some ways it caused problem, but then. I, it's about conduct in the end. And I felt I had to do what God was telling me. And, you know, I find that, and when you spoke about somebody speaking in another, lang in another language differently to what we used to in the congregation we're in, we experience that because over here, you know, in, say over here in, in the black people, we're very passionate people, aren't we? So when we're manifesting sometimes, we're quite, you know, passionate. And then the English person, they'll just sit there and the Lord will speak to them and they'll just speak. And then people will be criticized by that action. And um, this one has really got hold of me. It's not so much now, but unity is a far cry from uniformity and because god wants unity by his standard not by a little thing that we've made in our own building or in our denomination and um it was having to push through the prejudice say to go out to others because god was sending me and i used to talk to people on the train doesn't matter what color, what every, I used to just speak to people on the train. And because the Lord had led me that way, it was through other denomination I started missionary work because we didn't do it in our circle in the way you do. You get up, you travel to other country, you know, you roll your sleeves up. My first mission work was on a, in a, um, an orphanage in Kenya age children I mean it was at the time it was a frightening it was the most terrifying thing but that's where the Lord wanted me to go I never understood but had I kept into that little box I would have never had that experience hence I would not be working in so many different countries now so this is your teaching has just really informed informed me about you know uniformity because I think in parts we all may have certain little bits culture wise and it just helps me to think out of the box a bit more although I think I'm already thinking out of the box but it's just help but 
you know, with the dragnet and all that, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, wow, just thank God and thank you, because this is a powerful teaching. It, when you talk about the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, I have been certainly enlightened, well, this morning. <laughs> thank you. Amen. You could, you want to unmute Elder Collins and give your comments to um, Pastor McDonald and Evangelist Coda. Wow, I, I am so blown away um, listening to all you ladies that have commented so far. You evangelist, um, evangelist Coda, when she gave that perspective of real life fishing with her father and all that. I mean. Man, I am really blown away now listening to Pastor MacDonald. I'm really blessed by what I'm hearing here. I, I, I'm just, I, I, I feel like I'm going to just, when this, when this is true tonight, I'm just going to have a little dance in the room here. You know, I'm really excited, really excited, really, really. Thank you so much, ladies, for all that you have commented. I see a comment. Um, is that Pastor Gunn? Uh, let me see. I see uh, uh, in the chat. Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. It I says, Pastor, right. It he, says, Sir Collins had previously mentioned not all persons will speak in tongues as it relates to diversity of tongues, but is it a must that you speak in ton tongues to show you have received the Holy Ghost? And then we're coming to you, Sister Slow. All right. So this is a very good question. But, you know, I would want to reserve an answer for this for probably another study and not tonight because it can be a very controversial topic. So I would want to reserve this for another study, if that is okay with your Pastor Gun. But it's a very good question. Very, very good question. But um, let me just say this. Paul did ask the question do all speak with tongues <laughs> you know um, <laughs> do all heal do all you know he asks that question so we when when next when whenever we do touch on this topic then we'll see what is paul talking about because we we in pentecost we use the term initial evidence and we want to talk about that as well but as I said, that will have to be a study um, within itself. So I wouldn't attempt to touch it tonight. Sorry about that, Pastor Gun, but another time, because that can take an entire night or more. <laughs> All right. I doubt if that is Pastor Gun. I think it's Lady Gun. I think oh, it's, it's Lady Gun. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Good. Thanks. All right. So, Sister Valerie Slu, you may go ahead, ma'am. Greetings, greetings, everyone. I am, as usual, delighted to share in this Bible class. And I wanted Elder Collins to know I'll join the party. I'm ready to dance, too. <laughs> and I really and truly am blessed. I think this presentation is divine intervention. It's something we need, need, really need, especially at this particular time. Yes, yes. Um, we, we get so caught up in what we do and what other people do differently these days that the tolerance that we should have for each other, it is so difficult to come by that sometimes I wonder if we truly understand what the love of God is. But our God is truly amazing. He is thorough, he is detailed, and he showed that in every aspect of his creation. When I think of the different plants, the shape of their leaves, their height, the fruits that they bear, I, I said, um, our God must be truly amazing. Yeah. Even in the same family, we are so different, different temperament, different looks. Some, some have fine features, some have thicker features. Our hair colors are different. There mm -hmm. is so much 
and us. I mean, even identical twins show such differences even in their attitude to others that yeah. you wonder how did God get to do all of that if he is not this amazing, truly, truly thorough and detailed God yeah. about. And sometimes, I, I know sometimes I hear people say, I don't like red. Uh, that might be your personal taste, but nothing is wrong with red. The Lord made the red roses. <laughs> and the, the fruits that we eat have that color. When you think of the vegetables and their varying colors, and when you combine them together and serve them, how beautiful they are, one color would really be boring. But our amazing God made everything, every aspect of his creation, whether it be animals, humans, plants, whatever he made, he made such a variety that we yeah. really should understand that people are different yeah you go up in the same family or exposed to the same thing but you will go and make different choices even though you were exposed to the same teaching in church some people still don't agree and some people disagree vigorously True. even the words of god will go up in the same denomination hear the same teaching, and we will still disagree. I don't agree that this is so. And there we go now with the various denominations. Some people believe in the baptism in Jesus' name. Some people believe otherwise. And they explain it otherwise. But the point tonight is that we need to be tolerant of each other. We need to understand that every single human being has a different fingerprint. As detailed as that, God made us. Yep. So I, I take away tonight is that I must be grateful to God and appreciative of his divine reason and purpose for making us different, for varying every aspect of his creation and give him thanks for it rather than finding it as a way to divide and put down and criticize and tear down and make ourselves better than others. God bless you, Elder. When the party begins, I will join and dance. Bless you, everyone. Bless you. God bless you, Sister Valerie. Amen. You know, as Sister Valerie was talking about unity, I'd, I um, also made a note of that. Um, I remember one time Elder Collins watching this movie called Stepford Wives. And the thing disturbed me because they were making people like robots. So you had to be of the same um, built look, um, operated the same, dressed the same. Thank God God's kingdom is not like that. You know, as you were teaching, I thought about Adam and Eve. You know, the Bible calls Adam red man because from the red dirt he came but look at yeah. the diversity that's on earth and when you spoke about even being colorful i said that's exactly right you know i was talking to a friend and i was saying to her we ought to be multicultured you know yeah. our church is in bronx and it's in it's, it's there in new york you have a variety of people living there so when the net goes down it's supposed to bring up all different types of colors yeah. and and races and nations you know and unity as as you say, to do with agreement, not looking the same way. So we're not Stepford wives. We're not going to try to adjust ourselves to look like those or act like those, but be who God has called us to be. You look at Peter, you look at John, you look at James, you know, you look at all the disciples, they were all individually different. But when the Holy Ghost came, God used that personality to speak to the, the niche or the set of people that he wants right. them to minister to. So there's always right. somebody for you to reach based on how the Lord has made you. You know, and so we just give God thanks. This truly, truly, Sister Valerie, I agree with you. I want to be a part of that party too because this is just <laughs> so amazing. My Good God Almighty, God. the Lord bless you. Anyone else else with a comment or a question feel free to share feel free to share
All right, praise so there's God. none on. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, praise God. Um, as I listen to everyone today, there is a common ground. And the common ground is who is God? What is he to you? And the Bible states clearly how a person is to be saved. And otherwise, from that, it is wrong. So we have a common ground and we have the word of God and that is where we want to make sure that we stay focused on that. Uh, it is the word of God is that is going to make us ready and prepared to do his work and also to be ready to meet him. So we thank God for that's why Bible study is so is so necessary. When if you know Amen. I'm having a concern right now, our younger folks are not so much interested in, in, in Bible study. And and that's a problem. We just want to pray for our younger folks. Because this is hope. Because they are going to be the, 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 the future. In, in, you know, when we are gone, because I'm old, older, almost near 60. <laughs> I can't believe I actually say that. But, you know, <laughs> and the younger folks are going to come up behind us to, to, to carry on. And we, we want to earnestly pray for our younger folks that they will study the word of God. But it is what is going to lead them, guide them, and mold them into the, what we should be as, uh, and to be like, like, like Jesus. So that is our common ground. And we just want to keep praying and just look to him for he will keep us as long as we look to him in Jesus' name. God bless. You know, as, um, as Sister Collins spoke about common ground. I remember hearing a statement some very long time ago that there is more that unites us than what divides us. But, you know, sometimes we focus on the little things that divides us and don't realize we have more in common than we really believe, you know. Amen, I agree. Go ahead, Elder Rogers. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord. I, I'm just sitting here and just digesting all that has been taught so far. But um, Sister Collins have raised a very important point there when he said that there is the younger folks are not so interesting in Bible study. And I remember listening to um, Dr. Joe Nelson speaking one day when he said, back in, in the Middle East, when they teach the word of God, and, um, they would have some honey. And one, what they would do that anytime a child would mention the name of Jesus Christ, they would tip a little honey on that purse, on that child's tongue, and they tasted it. So every time they mention Jesus, then it is sweet like honey. So that name becomes so sweet in their taste. <laughs> now we have a set of teachers, so-called teachers, that is actually instead of bringing people to God to enjoy the sweetness of God, then what they're giving them is something that gives them some kind, there's a thing that they call colic when you, you just don't want to be a part of it. It's not enticing, it's not, I mean, there was a, there, there's a verse of scripture in John that says when the kingdom of the gospel is preached those that hear this message are forcing their way into it but they have some teachers who are causing you to run away from i mean they're saying if this is what this is all about i don't want to be a part of it i mean our teacher tonight 
God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Bless you. Bless you too. You know, um, just just following up on Elder Rogers, the, the, he's quite right. There's a lot of damage that has been done. Um, and uh, it's going to take a lot of work to undo some of the damage and hurt as far as the teaching of the word is concerned, you know, but a lot of um, damage and poor teaching. And uh, we have a lot of folks that are seriously misguided as a result of that. And um, as it relates to young people, I know this is not necessarily a forum. I know um, Evangelist Michelle, she's doing such a fantastic job with, with the youngsters. And uh, there are things she probably, you don't know that she's doing. She's not just teaching youngsters on a weekly basis, but she's reaching out to youngsters, troubled youngsters as well, those that have been um, abused in different ways. And um, she has a very powerful ministry that is going on. So she's one of those persons God is really raising up in these last days that that can actually touch these youngsters, not just teaching, but actually understanding them um, and using methodologies that does help um, in the communicating this word to the youngsters because sometimes the methodology that we have used over the years, it doesn't work. I was sharing um, with someone last night uh, about the, uh, what is it now? Um, something sunk fallacy. I was trying to remember. But it's, the, it's a method of using, uh, doing something a way that we have always done it because we have invested heavily in that method and um, even though we know that the benefits are not as good as if we abandon using that method, but there are still folks that insist on using the only method that they have ever used, even at the price of losing folks. And um, I think it's called, I'm going to try and find the name of that. It's a uh, something sunk fallacy. I came across it just last week and it was quite interesting. Um, so the methodologies will definitely has to change. Is somebody saying something? The methodologies that we use will, will have to be changed um, as it relates to um, our young, young folks. Um, it's sunk cost fallacy. You can read it up when you have the chance. Sunk that's S-U-N-K, cost fallacy. And it's the method of using something that really doesn't have any benefit anymore. But because we have heavily invested in it, we still use it, even though we know there is no benefit from it. And until we fix that, we're going to keep losing a lot of our youngsters. And I like what Sister um, Kerryan is doing using the technology which the youngsters are using and not seeing the technology as the devil's system as some people see it. but she's using it and she's actually uh, making a good footprint in the lives of these youngsters god bless you sister karen for what you're doing our prayers are with you continually all right Amen. over to you Hallelujah, indeed. Thank you so much. I receive it in Jesus' name. I'm going to look more into this. You know, as, as Elder Rogers was talking, I said to myself, mental note, you need to do this whenever you have, you know, an, an in-person teaching, get some honey and put it, you know, just, <laughs> just encourage it because I love it. It's so beautiful. It's a Jewish practice. My it was a God. Jewish practice then. Yes. yes, I love it, man. This is an intro, and this is something different to us here in the Western world. I love it. My God, beautiful. Go ahead, Evangelist Coda. I'm just going to see this. I hope I don't get any stone. But... The book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 7, 10 and 11. The Bible says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogues of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, 
and that they receive the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Yeah. I, re I read this scripture just to say that you do have young people who want the word of God, want more of the word of God, but there are not many teachers who are willing to acknowledge that there are some errors, to acknowledge that you can't ask certain questions. You are not allowed to ask certain questions because possibly of your age, possibly you are deemed immature or you don't have enough information. I've had experiences where I've sat down in classes, Bible classes, and I listened to teachings that were error. I know that they're error because I've seen the truth and I was not able to ask a question because um, persons are, are, are stuck to what they believe. So that is one of the reasons why our young people, okay, I've had young people who, told, who tells me this too. They are not able to, they, 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 don't, they don't want to sit down and to take the teaching because you're not able to um, meet them at their need. You're not able to acknowledge that, you know, something, we can talk about something, we can um, discuss something, you're just supposed to choke on what is being taught, but there is no grounds for communication. There are some young people who really spend time reading the word of God, who really spend time studying the word of God and spend time in the presence of God. And if you spend time in God's presence, the Holy Ghost is, is, is the interpreter of all scriptures and God is able to guide you through the scriptures. God is able to teach you his word. And so I believe that there is no man that is too big or too old with no disrespect to communicate the scriptures based on what the revelation of the Holy Ghost. And so that's why I appreciate Elder Collins, Elder Sharp, Elder Hill and others, because we're able to have a discourse where we're not perfect, but young people are struggling with this is concerned and I am one of them. God bless you. That is true. Glory be to God. Go ahead, Elder Hill and the Hill family. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise him. Um, wonderful teaching, man of God. We are blessed tonight. And this word, you know, it is resonating. And there is just so much that, you know, we have to we can go into, especially listening to all the comments. What the thought that came to me was that the, if the word, if we must write, if we must study to show ourselves approved, that we must rightly divide the word, then it goes to say that we can also wrongly divide the word. Yeah. And I believe there has to be a place of accountability because you have people who have raised up themselves, so to speak, gathered flocks among, you know, gathered flock and is, is teaching. And there is no one there that is holding them accountable for the things that they are saying. And these things are going across, as Sister Koda just said, to people. And they cannot question it. They just have to take it. You know, there has to be in the body of Christ, some measure of accountability. People, has, people have to be held accountable for the things that they are saying. A lot of these things, if we look at Africa and what is happening there now, I mean, this, the, the rise of these so-called prophets and hmm. men of God and papas, and they are telling people to eat grass. They, they're stepping on them, man. A lot of things are happening in the name of Christianity and religion. And I think, you know, we have to be, we have to come to the place where we are bold enough 
to call out some of these dogmas, you know, to, to correct them, to speak the truth in love. And I mean, as the Lord gives us the revelation of his word, not be afraid to speak the truth of God. I mean, the Bereans, they, they search the scriptures for themselves. And if we search the scriptures for ourselves and recognize that what we are hearing from some quarters or what we have known is not so, the onus is upon us to yeah. change. I understand that we will face cognitive dissonance in terms of people hearing things that seems new to them. And even when it is the truth revealed, because what they have held on to for so long, it seems like, you know, you cannot let go of it. You know, we're going to have to get to the place where we just have to speak the truth in love. I mean, people are going to fight it. But one thing with the truth, you may deride it. You may speak against it. But there it is. It stands, you know, on its own. And the word of God is truth. Right? And what is true is not necessarily truth. Because... uh Things, situation change, but the word of God is truth because it never changes. And if I hear something that I was told that it is the word of God and something is revealed, the truth of the word of God is revealed, I have to go with what is the truth because the law was true and it did what it was supposed to do. But according to the plan of God, it was not the truth because Jesus came as the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth. And it was a schoolmaster to bring you to the truth. And once the truth come, you yes. have no need of the schoolmaster. So we have to understand that people have to be held accountable. And yep. we just cannot sit by and allow things to be said, knowing these things are errors and the Lord reveal the truth to us and we not come forward. So I'm glad for teachings like this that can, you know, bring forth the truth. And it is only truth that can make us free. God bless you. Amen. Amen. You know, if I can say one thing in regards to what you and Evangelist Coda said, you know, sometimes we think that in order to right the wrong, we have to go and have a confrontation and a contention. But what we can do is teachings like this. That's establishing the truth and we're making sure that it is going out to all the, the, the quarters of the earth because there's an operation, there's an order. And when you're out of God's order because you want to set this right, then you're trying to see you're trying to stand in the position of God. You see, we yeah. contend, but it's not a contention. The contend is to know how to operate and to do it in such a wisdom that you're not totally eradicating you know persons that would live in that ministry but you're giving them life by bringing them into scriptural truths and walking them through each of God's words and so there's an operation as you said elder you know there is an accountability that we must take up you know Amen. each of us including themselves are accountable yes you know so Amen. really appreciate that amen there was someone else with their hand up. I think about Shan. Shan. Oh, Sister Shan, just before yeah. Evangelist Coda. Go ahead, Sister Shan. Hello. Good night, everybody. Um, hello, Elder Collins. You know, I am a young person too, and I am so blessed. I am so honored to be in teachings like this because uh, nowadays, ministry, a lot of the ministries are being raped by money just it is being too much commercialized you know and so the essence of what oh bringing the word of god across it has lost its essence because of all of those things that i just mentioned however um i just want to bring a point across where <coughs> sorry my throat is sick i had the flu i just want to bring a point across where you know when i just started ministry when I just went into the church and I remember the first time <coughs> I'm sorry I went into church um in 2015 when I just went back into church I mean I grew up in church but when I start going back to church and the first time I went to church <clears throat> and I sat down I had on a dress 
it was a little above my knees. And a lady came to me and threw a cloth to me and said, oh, you must wear that short dress to come to church. I was so embarrassed to the point that I wanted to get up and leave. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is if we're going to be calling people to Christ, we also have to be cognizant of the different type of people that we're dealing with, how we deal with people. And so that is a big turn off for a lot of young people. And that's why, I mean, I'm sorry, my throat is bad. You don't see too many young people in church because you hear them say, um, Christians judge them. They say all kinds of things. They don't want to go to church for various reasons. I was like that. I was like that. I didn't want to go to church after that incident. Excuse me. <laughs> after that incident, I was so turned off and I was about to take up my bag and leave. And I said, I'm not going back to the church because the lady embarrassed me in front of everybody. No. Yes, it may have been a spirit of offense on my part because the Holy Spirit wasn't sorry, directing me to say, Shanique, you can't dress like that. I mean, I thought it was okay because it was a little bit above my knees, but my knees were showing. <laughs> so um, when she did that, I was very embarrassed and I said, you know what? I'm not going back to the church. However, something kept on bringing me back. And now I'm at a point in my life <clears throat> where I can look back and say, you know, when I step in church, you can know that I'm dressed by the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we have to be careful how we bring across things to people. And <coughs> I'm so sorry, guys. It's how right, we, bring things, right. how we yeah. bring things across to people, especially young people, you know, they grow mm. up with this notion that, you know, they are being judged. Church people are not good. Christian people are not good. And so it is a big turn off. But it is such a blessing for me to be in here, to be receiving this word, to be able to, when I, when I come in this Bible study, sometimes I'm not able to, because I have work and sometimes I do forget, sorry. But I tell you, when I come in this, these sessions on a Monday night, I take a lot of notes and I do share the notes with other young people too. You know, I'll take my notes and I'll send it in WhatsApp. Just like um, when Evangelist Coda, when she sends a prayer, I send it out to other young people too. So, you know, I just want to say, <coughs> guys, continue, continue with imparting the word of God in such a way that is very appeasing to not only elders, but young people and bring it, bringing it across in such a way that it is a, like a baby bite as someone earlier said. So yeah, that is my take. Thank you so much, um, Sister Shan. Really appreciate that. Just hearing, hearing, um, you express yourself is really encouraging to us that are involved in this ministry. And um, certainly we crave your prayers as well. Thank you so much for that contribution. Thank you. And, and sorry, guys, for the coughing. Like my voice has been gone for a couple of days. Like the change of weather here has been affecting me really badly. Yeah. And so I have a terrible cough, a terrible cough to the point where I had short of breath, but it's getting way better. So I do apologize for the coughing. It's all right. We understand. Thank you again. That's all right. I unmuted actually to speak healing over your throat in the name of Jesus. Mighty God, even now, Lord God, you are a deliverer, Lord Jesus, and a bomb in Gilead. Breathe in Hallelujah. Sister Shan's body, I pray, God. Breathe in her lungs, God. Let your hearers circulate, Lord God. Remove every dryness, every mucus. Lord God, hydrate her throat even now, we pray, Lord God. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you will restore, Lord Jesus, normal function in Jesus' mighty name. And we'll give you the glory, the honor, and the praises. And Say thank, thank you, you. Jesus. Glory name. be to God. Go ahead, Evangelist Coda. Amen, amen, amen. 
Amen. I wonder if we're going to end tonight. But I want to ask <laughs> Elder Collins, I want to ask you something. You're doing a teaching, and at the end of the teaching, an error is being pointed out to you. And the error has um, proof. What would be your response? So it's pointed out privately. What would be your response? Or I mean like someone um, write in the chat privately? No, reach out to you or after the teaching or so, just to say that you said this, but based on proof, this is it. What would you do? Okay, so um, it's always up for discussion. Um, I certainly, as much as I pray that God leads and direct, I have never taken the position to ever think that what comes off, out of my mouth is infallible. And neither should anyone that teaches, preaches, because we are, we are still men, we are still human beings, and um, we can make mistakes. And this is why we have the question and answer. So uh, once, once the time will afford discussion, we'll discuss. And even in discussion, it should not be one where I'm trying to push my idea on you. It should be one that is open because I can learn from you. You can learn from me. And I, I don't have all the answers. I'll be very honest. I am still learning. I am still learning. And we all should be still learning. So, you know, that's me. I'm, 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 I'm open to, to, to conversations. So this is one of the biggest things that I, I personally struggle with because I am careful with the information that, is, that I receive. Um, why? Remember, I'm one that releases information. And so if I receive information that is not um, um, correct and I release it, I'm, I'm furthering something that is not, not, not correct. And so this is one of the issues that I have. There are many that are not willing to accept um, where something is, is, is incorrect. And we continue until it become a gospel. When it yeah. become a gospel, they they're not able to correct that, and it goes down into you know one of the things that we continue to do as um, people of God. I find this find out that we make something doctrines and we we create our own paths, and we want people to just continue into our own ideologies and doctrines, even if it is error. And this this is one of the things that I struggle with greatly, Sister Mitchell and I, as we consider ourselves accountability partners. And one of the things that we agree to is that when we minister, we go back and we listen to each other teaching. You know, if there's an error there, one of the mistakes that I often made is I, I mistake Elisha for Elijah. And Sister Mitchell would often times say, you make the mistake again. Listen to it again ensure that you know you pick out because there's no one that is perfect pick out right. those right. Errors that yeah. and this is yeah. the struggle that i have you know I, I i sit down and i hear it it's okay you're a human being you made that mistake but what do you do when that mistake is made i have seen it where individual just continue with the error yeah. and don't yeah. hear no can you sit and you listen to somebody like that if they do not care, that's next, all. God bless. Next, next week, God's willing, um, because I'll be touching a little bit of that as we look at the separation of the the, the fish. Um, we'll be looking at uh, different groups that have popped up since uh, 1970, coming up, and what exists now, even in some of our churches and some of the teachings that are taking place. Uh, the, the Bible does have an answer for everything, you know, and um, it's just that not everyone is rightly dividing the truth and not everyone that takes a microphone or calls themselves a teacher are even properly taught. And so that is why we have terminologies like exegesis and hermeneutics and all these kind of things, because there's a way to rightly divide the word. And um, some people use what they call um, 
first principle. Um, and they, they, they believe that everything that happens in Genesis is, um, you know, once it appears in Genesis, that's how it's going to be right through. You know, it have its merit, but it is not a reliable source for solid Bible teaching. Hermeneutics is what is more is more um, reliable because it looks at context, it looks at um, origins and all that kind of thing. So, um, and this is why we have errors because people are not properly taught. And some people use one verse of scripture to create a doctrine and they are determined to just run with it, <laughs> you know. But um, God's willing next week, we, we'll look, look on this a little. You know, no no promises, but we'll try and look on this a little. All right. And if I could add to that too, you know, I want to say that it's okay to go back and adjust if you have an error. You know, yeah. I was teaching on a Friday night on um the tribes of Israel, and I tend to forget, even right now, I still cannot remember the one that was um joined with Judah in the southern kingdom. And so that night I made an error in mentioning who was aligned to them. And somebody typed it in the chat, but I only read a part of it. And when I went back over, because I love to scrutinize and make sure that I'm doing it right. When I went back over, I saw that and I came the next week to adjust it. I don't want to be responsible for leading people into error. And so right. if I just call that, that's a very um, valid question that you have asked. I pray that everyone that ministers the, the, the word should look into themselves and see if somebody has corrected me with something that is clearly not it. I have a responsibility to go and fix it. Do you want to be a false prophet? Do you want to be a false teacher? No, you do not. So you're responsible for the information that you're releasing. Release truth. Fix it if you need to fix it. But don't let it stay there knowing that it is wrong. And everybody should be a Berean. You yeah. Know, cross, cross examine everything you hear. I, 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 I am weary of preachers that will tell you when they open their, when they preach, when they're going to preach and they, they quote their scripture. But these might be textual preachers. They might not be expository. And when they, when they're finished quoting the scripture that which that we're going to preach from, they tell everybody to close your Bible. I don't want anybody with their Bible open. No, they can't get me to do that, you know, because I'm like a berry and I am taking every word they say and I'm going, my Bible is constantly over, whether it's the paper or it's going to be on the tablet or the cell phone, whatever. I'm constantly examining. I'm not, I'm not necessarily just checking you out, you know, but that's just me. And I think everybody should take that kind of a position. Don't, don't, don't swallow everything you hear. Not, not from me, not from me either, you know, because I do make mistakes, right? and I'm the first to admit that. Amen. Amen, I agree. Go ahead, Elder Sharp, your hand was up, sir. Please come. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise God. <laughs> you know, I sit here and I'm, I'm smiling. <laughs> We're doing overtime tonight. <laughs> I'm smiling. <laughs> You know, just listening to the comments and all of that and the explanation. Ella Collins, God bless you. Vandis Mitchell, God bless you. Bless you. <laughs> I want to look at, tell you a story about something that we keep doing. There was a mother. She always watched her mother when they buy the ham. Her mother would always cut the ham bone in two and put it in the pot and cook it. And several years after, the daughter got a bigger pot, but she would still cut the ham bone and put it in the pot. One day her daughter said to her, why is it, mommy, that you always cut the ham bone and put it in the pot? And she said, because my mother always cut it and put it in the pot. <laughs> and she went to her grandmother and said, Grandma, why do you always, you used to cut that ham bone? And she said, because the pot was too small to hold the whole ham bone. <laughs> so I cut it and put it in the pot. And she said, but Mama have a bigger pot now. <laughs> and Mama still cutting the ham bone and put it in there. I say that to say this, brethren, 
sometimes we see some things happening and we don't understand why it used to happen. You see, some of the things that we used to do when we were younger, we follow somebody else and do it and we don't understand why they did it. Now that you have a bigger part, stop cutting the ham bone, huh? put it in the pot, it will hold. <laughs> <laughs> my God, my God. I Get say that, that brethren, because I want yeah. to bring a point across. <laughs> I once heard of a prophetess who said to the young people, don't carry your phone, come to church and talk about your reading the Bible from the phone because that is not the Bible. The devil is a liar. <laughs> Listen to me, brethren. I carry my phone to church, carry my tablet, and if I have my computer, I carry it. And sometimes I leave my <laughs> Bible <laughs> at home. But printed I, Bible. <laughs> you see, brethren, if we are going to be able to relate to the younger folks, yeah. we have to change with the time. I don't say yeah. change the um, the word, you know, I say change with the time. Right. To understand what is really going on. Yeah. I heard Sister Shan said something and it troubled my heart. Yeah that she went to church and because her dress was slightly above her knee, it caused a problem. Let me tell you something, brethren. I looked at a picture some time ago and there were some sisters that were standing beside the bishop of the organization and their dresses were about four inches above their knee. Do you know that when I used to go to school, the rule of the school was the, chi the young ladies' dresses must be four inches above their knees. Ah, what has caused some of the problems in the church today, especially with the young lady that her dress drop out early is because some of us as men, we have sexualized the sisters in the church. Mm. And until we start correcting some of these things, some of these poor sisters come and they don't have anything more than the one little dress. Sometime our sister yeah. dress she put on yeah. and come to church and we're going to embarrass them. Some of us men need to put bandaid over our eyes that we cannot see some of the ladies. We have the problem. Why are we putting it on them? If that's all they have, brethren, for crying out loud, when they come to church, left them alone and they come to praise God. Can we get to that place that we stop sexualizing our, our daughters, our mothers, our sisters? We talk about culture and a brethren. Do you know that there are some places in Africa that the women are um, go be breasted? Yeah. How would some of us, None. some of us as men, how would we manage? How in Jesus' name would we manage? Until we get to the place, brethren. And I believe in modesty. Let me hasten to say that. Yeah. But modesty is a relative term. <laughs> Not trouble somebody a while ago and I said modesty is relative. In some culture, anything that is above your ankle is not modest. <laughs> if we mm -hmm. understand culture, brethren, some yeah. of the things that we are quarreling about here in the Western world would keep quiet. But like I said, this is our mm -hmm. culture. So we should dress accordingly so right. that we don't cause offense. But like I said, brethren, can we for once stop sexualizing the women in the church? The reason why we have so much problem in the church today with even some of the young men is what we see on the TV, what we hear from the pulpit, that sister, you must, sisters must wear the, the sleeve down to them wrist. Sisters must wear the skirt down to their ankles because somebody have a problem if they see the elbow. Somebody have a problem if they see the sister's arm. Um, um, 
knees. Kneecap. <clears throat> God help us, brethren. God help us. But like I said, we have come to the time that we as Christians, as men, let me say us as men, because sometimes the problem is with some of us as men, you know, we don't have the mind of Christ. We cannot control our eyes and we have problems. And what we do, we get the opportunity to go from the pulpit sometimes and we start spilling our hearts. But God help us, brethren. Brethren, God bless you, young people, Jesus. young sisters. If it's the one little skirt you have, go to church same way. Amen. <laughs> If that's yeah. all you have, still worship the Lord. The Lord will provide something more for you, but don't stay away. Don't be ashamed of what you have. If that is what the Lord provides for you, and some of us, give it to your wife or money to your wife and ask your wife, since you have a problem, go help that little sister, buy her one longer skirt that she can come that it don't offer. Let Brother Sharp say that it don't offend Brother Sharp anymore. God bless you. You know, um, Ella Sharp, sorry, but we're really going over time tonight. We've gone all triple time. But, <laughs> but you know, the, the, the thing that, that really came out to me, though, with Sister Shan was the way she was addressed, um, the, the public humiliation. And this is something that, churches need to correct right um we yeah. we sometimes think that the pastor the elder the deacon the apostle whatever we call them has the right to publicly humiliate anyone nobody has that right no say that no and i'll say it forever no one has the right to publicly humiliate anyone in the book of colossians chapter four it says that let your conversation in new international version be always full of grace seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone and we can look at the different translation or words that we use if we if we when we speak in love the bible says speak the truth in love thank you sir and in love don't mean just with love because some people say may I speak the truth because I love them <laughs> no you must speak it in love which means in a loving way if Amen. you don't like nobody, humiliate you and embarrass you, you don't do it to nobody else. Exactly. It, irrespective of your title and position. And like what Sister Shan went through, that if a person thought that she needed to correct her dressing, she could have taken her one side, ask her, um, are you having a problem with, with, with a dress? Do you need, can we help you? Or something like that. But you don't humiliate people. And then stand up feeling that you're so anointed and say you're standing in your apostolic authority and the Holy Ghost inside of you and all that. That's no Holy Ghost. Not at all. If Not God knows you humiliate us, why should we be humiliating anybody else? And that really yeah. is the part that really troubled me because yes. some of us, you know, in our self-righteousness really don't know how to talk to people. And Amen. we're trying to fix the church and we're trying to scale fish before we even yeah. catch it. If you notice, it was after they brought the dragnet onto the shore Thank that you. they started now sorting things out. We trying to scale them while they're still in the sea. And as a young convert just coming in, you know, that certainly was not the way for it to be handled. But I, I trust that the church, church leaders and those of us that are missionaries and whatever in our churches will change our approach so that we don't drive folks out of the church you know, as we try to preserve the, the holiness of our assemblies. My God. Back to you, um, moderator. <laughs> Amen. So after these two, we're not going to take any more because we're long past the time. So go ahead, Sister <laughs> Shen. <laughs> I'm back with a better voice now. Um, that was my first time going to the church. So it was a <clears throat> big turn off. Okay. But I have a question for Elder Collins that, I, I, and I don't want to stray too much. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to stray too much. But do you think, or in your opinion, do you think one of the reasons why you may not see much young people in school, for instance, <clears throat> Bible study, is it because ministry has gone to this thing where 
you know, you, you'll see a lot of young people in churches that where the pastor is prophesying or they go on a platform and as they're gone, a pastor pick them out and say, you, you are going to do this. You are going, do you see that more people, not even just young people, but more people are gravitating to that sort of thing. I've seen it because before I met up with Evangelist Koda on TikTok, thank God for her, um, I was invited to several um, prayer meetings, certain Bible studies, and you know, it's always about prophecy and it's almost as if people are paying for prophecy. And that is why I mentioned earlier that a lot of these hurry come up prophets, pastors, they're raping the ministry. And I'm wondering if all the people are pushing or being gravitate or, or it, they're gravitating towards that sort of thing because people don't think that they can hear directly from God because they're not they're not um, having that personal relationship with God they don't have that platform or that forum where they're being taught the word of God properly but them just want to hear something from a pastor that can tell them this is going to happen to them that is going to happen to them so Elder Collins do you think that ministry has gone to that nowhere most or more more people are gravitating to that sort of thing you, you pretty much have answered it you know you have hit the nail on the head um there's too many people in christendom that are seeking a personal prophecy in their life and this seems to be the the new order of the day everybody wants a personal prophecy and it and that happens because people have lost faith in what the lord has said concerning them that they are special. So they, 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 it's like you want to feel special and you want everybody to see that you are special. So everybody is looking for the opportunity to be, to be singled out so that you can show up, say, hey, see, they singled me out, I'm special. But you know, you, you're quite right. You, you did hit the nail on the head. There, there, there is too much of that happening right now. And it is causing a serious uh, misguidance even for young people, you know, um, they're, they're really missing out on really having that relationship with God because they are relying on a personal prophecy. And we don't need that to survive in this day. We just need the word. We just need the word. The scripture says, God in sundry time and diverse yeah. manner, spoken yeah. unto our fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days, yeah. spoken unto us by his son Jesus Christ. Yeah. So I tell people anything you will tell me, you know, that the Lord said make certain it match up with the scripture. If it don't, I will <laughs> reject it and I have a right to do that. Oh yes you do. <laughs> yeah. If I if I can say something here, I saw Sister Coda's hand up. Sorry for cutting in Sister Coda. Um it, Sister Shan really brought up a very, very important situation. And I think it's one of the problems that we face now in the church, the, the, the modern church. Um, we do not take or we take for granted the written word. Anything that God is going to say, he has already said in his word. Anything you hear God say or somebody say that God said, it's actually a confirmation of what he has already said. So as Ella Sharp just said, whatever is going to be said must be backed up backed by, up the, by word the word of God, by the written word. Yeah. Now, Ella Collins spoke about it earlier. And I'm telling you, there are pastors, there are preachers who come into the pulpit with a song book or they come with a song and they preach from the song and they say they don't have to open the scriptures they don't have to open the word and i'm telling you saints of god we are having a problem and just like how you have the eunuch baptism that we sometimes ascribe to that we just come and preach and take up people and baptize them because we say the Ethiopian eunuch says, see, here is water. <laughs> Anyhow, we don't have structure. We are going to have problems. Yeah. People, 
baptize after they or should baptize after they believe. And how you believe? Believe after you are taught, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying somebody can just come and you know be led to be baptized and and baptized, but people should be baptized after they believe, right? It is not the baptism that saves you, is the belief that saves. That's right. And we, people of God, we have put this emphasis on prophecy. And there are people, um, Pharaoh, and most leaders in the in the early centuries, even in, in even to now, most leaders always have what is called a prophet, right? Hitler, he had prophet. Pharaoh, he had prophet, right? And they would consult these prophets. And this thing, I think, got away to the extent that the word of God was lost. And when, um, I think it was Josiah, your teacher can correct me here. When he recognized that the yeah, skull exactly. was found, he rent his garment. Right, because we were operating all this time, and this was the word of God that we were not going by. Right, so we must understand, people of God. If right now you are some people that, if you go up to preach and you come with your notes, you seek out acceptable words and you come with your notes. Some churches they turn off, some pastors them not call you back, right? Because you must just come and preach out a thin ear. And call out this and call out whatever. And that is sort of the order of the day. And everybody wants a personal prophecy. You understand? We must get back to the word. I have right. seen churches where the people don't need, don't read the word anymore because they are looking for the prophet or the prophetess to come and say, Thus said the Lord yeah. God Almighty. So they not read, need to read the word again because once the prophet can come and say, Me see you, I see you. And the Lord says so and so. Me don't need to read the word again. So me just listen to the prophet and me carry soft drinks and crackers going to give the prophet all the while because me want a look a word. You understand? <laughs> we need to get back to the scriptures. Amen. 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 God, so true, Elder Hill. Mighty God, I love it. Go ahead, Evangelist Koda. God bless you, Elder Hill. Thank you so much. Sister Shan, if you recognize on TikTok, if there's 300 people on TikTok, 200 of them is dropping their name in the chat asking me to give them a word. <laughs> I could be teaching the word of God, preaching the word of God. I'm telling you, 200 of those comment, people commenting are asking me either to pray for them, give them a word. Two of the things that people really run after is one, prophecy. And two, blessings. If you are pronouncing blessings over their lives, they will run you down if you prophesy. Yeah. But you remember the night when I was preaching about hell? How many of them run off that line? They don't want to hear that. But guess what? The good thing is, the ones that are supposed to receive, that wants the word of God, they are going to get it. And the people that are being saved, are the ones that really want God. You don't have to worry when they come and say, I am ready. You know, it's not a prophecy why they are turning to God. It's a very word that brings it word. to God. But what I wanted to say is, I remember um, I saw a young lady. She was about 16 years old. Um, she sat in the church that I used to go to. Um, I saw her in a store and I felt like the need to, to go and to encourage her. I could recognize that she wasn't in a position of um, where she was. She was more leaning towards the side of, you know, coming out of church. And so I was just led to encourage her. I went and I opened her and I encouraged her, saints of God. I encouraged the young lady so much that, you know, she felt so warm. I could see that there was a glow coming from her after I finished talking to her. After I was done talking to her in that store, I went into another store and there were some church people in that store from that same church and I was talking to them. No, 
Now the young lady walked through the door and I hear one of the church sisters give out. You left my pants, no to shots, body rider. And where you gonna go next? I said, my God. I just lay a foundation of oh, the, on this young lady that would have caused her to know, just want to come back into the love and the full of yeah. God. When I saw the young lady look at that um, church sister as though she looked at, at her with such disgust, mm -hmm. My God, I, I I waited until she left out of that place and I went back to her and I said, this is the reason why God allowed me to console you in the beginning. Listen, God doesn't look on the outward appearance. You look at what is in your heart and the only thing I want you to do is to love God. Because if, you see, if you don't love God, you cannot serve God. She was so broken, saints of God, just a few minutes between that. And there it goes. There it goes. So I want to say, let us, let us treat them differently. Let us understand them a little bit more. A lot, of, a lot of young people have been broken and have been going through a lot. And if you're not able to meet them at their need, they're not going to listen to you. We have to understand that our young people have something called peer pressure to deal with. It's not a easy thing, you know, to constantly wear a skirt, to constantly wear a dress when they, they're seeing their peers wearing a pants and doing other things. And if you want to, 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 to somebody to follow a certain guideline, you do not force it. You encourage it. Encourage it. Do not force them. That's all. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Evangelist Cody. You know, we're going to end. Um, tonight but i want to leave this note with us remember the care that it takes for a fisherman to pull his dragnet out or trawl net it is the same care we as a people of god should have for each other romans 12 talks about honoring each other above ourselves you know the teacher should wait and teaching the prophet should wait and prophesying the minister should wait and ministering because as the lord has done to you so should you do to another Amen. And so tonight, I want to encourage the body of Christ. Let us see each other as ourselves. You know, if we truly see that and value souls like Jesus does, because a fisherman knows that his catch is his riches. So he treats it well because that's his finance. So would we, if we understand that soul is heaven's currency, we will treat it with care and love. And so on that note, I want to pray for Elder Collins, and then I'm going to ask Elder Sharp if he has any last um, words to leave with us, do so and to close. So I'm going to pray a special prayer for Elder Collins in the name of Jesus. Lord, we want to thank you for your son, Hashataya. Truly, Lord God Almighty, when he comes on a Monday night, he leaves something that leaves, Lord Jesus, an indelible mark on the soul that makes you look on yourself. It makes you do in introspection, Lord Jesus, and it makes you, Lord God Almighty, want to do better, God. And this is what your word is, God. It comes to change. It comes to transform. It comes, Lord God, to bring life. And so tonight, I cover your son under your blood. I pray, Lord God, that you'll continue, Lord Jesus, to deposit within him, pouring virtue into him, Lord God. Let him be, Lord God, this teacher, Lord God, that teaches in, in humility, Lord God Almighty, and touches the very spirit and soul of man. I cover his wife. I cover their home. I cover their children. I cover his ministry. I cover his mind. I cover his holistic health and that of his family. In the name of Jesus, bless them going. Bless them coming. Lord Jesus, rebuke every repercussion, every Every reprisal, God, every attack, every counter attack in the name of Jesus. We command regrouping spirits to receive confusion and to flee in the name of Jesus, Lord God Almighty. Continue to bless your son, Lord God, with the riches, Lord God Almighty, of understanding your word. God, pull him into the secret chambers of your word, God. Are your eyes deeper depths? Let deeper things call unto him. Lord Jesus, pull him, Lord God Almighty, into some dimensions with you, Lord God, that he is literally 
experiencing the word God. Father, I pray, Lord Jesus, satire, that you will not only, Lord Jesus, give him revelatory knowledge, Lord God, but pull him into the rima, Lord God. Father, I pray, Lord Jesus, that when he goes into the word, God, he will see you because your words, they testify of you. Lord Jesus, I pray, Lord God Almighty, that you will expand the audience that he speaks to, Lord God Almighty, in the name of Jesus, not just on this Zoom, not just on social media, not just in churches, God, but mighty God. I pray, Lord God, that you'll provide some deep waters for him. When he goes, Lord God, on the streets, when he goes into the supermarkets, when he's driving along, God. I pray, Lord God, over his children, Lord God Almighty, that they will also have, Lord God Almighty, a greater appetite for the word, God. Bless his inheritance. Bless his offspring. Bless them for many generations to come, God. Let his faith, his strength never fail, Lord God. God, or that of Sister Donna in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you tonight and we bless you indeed. Cover this platform. Strengthen and cover Elder Sharp. Strengthen and cover Elder Ill. Strengthen and cover Elder Mark and their families and their children. God, bless them continually. God, even as they are blessing souls, even as they are doing this great work of the ministry, God, bless their families, I pray, Lord God. Bless their health. Bless their finances, God. Bless their endeavors, Lord Jesus. Jesus, and mighty God, we give you thanks for them. In Jesus' holy name we pray and say amen and amen. Lord, we thank you. We bless your name. We worship you and we praise you. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you for Evangelist Mitchell that you have placed in the gap tonight, Lord. May your hand be upon her always. May your peace that passes all understanding, Lord, be deliberately written in her heart. May you bless her going out and her coming in. Help her to know that you're with her. You're protecting her and you'll always be there for her. Bless Ella Collins, Ella Marks, Ella Hill and family, Van Liscord and all the other individuals, Lord, who is present here before you tonight. We just ask that your peace that passeth all understanding, Lord, will be indelibly written in our hearts and our lives. Help us, Lord, as we go. We'll go in peace and go in your name. Your love will always flow in our hearts. Your peace will always abound in our lives. Go with us, bless us, sanctify, and keep us. Let your peace that passeth all understanding be indelibly written in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless you all, brethren. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much, Evangelist Kerian, for stepping in at such short notice to um, moderate tonight's um, study. Man, what a blessing it has been. Such a <laughs> blessing. Ah, I tell you, may God continue to give you overflow. Sister Coda, thank you so much. You really contributed valuably to this study tonight sister shan Ella sharp just about everyone i just want to acknowledge a few other persons carol my sister-in-law that is on also i'm seeing well Ella rogers who is on all the time i'm seeing deacon laws amen and also evangelist juliet wright there are probably some other folks that have not identified themselves but just about everyone thank you so much for making tonight your stop. Amen. And we certainly look forward to see you joining us again next week. God's willing. God bless you all. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you, Van Right. I see you.
God bless you. Thanks. God bless. Good night, everyone. God bless you all. Bless. God bless. Bye bye. God bless, God bless everyone. Good night. Blessings, Elder. Blessings, man. <laughs>